and, and it, is, it is time, so we shall begin. <clears throat> Hi. Okay, so first we have a disclaimer. Uh, this talk was sponsored and written by 100% ethically sourced human brain meat furnished by yours truly. No content of this talk was knowingly furnished by or the product of an AI or ML system. Uh, all logos slash trademarks are copyright their respective owners. Uh, and uh, while my employer has graciously sponsored my attendance and game night. Uh, this work is an entirely self-indulgent exercise that reflects only my personal taste or lack thereof. Uh, that is to say that the views and opinions expressed in this following presentation are my own and any resemblances those held by past, current, future, or alternate timeline versions of my employers, affiliated institutions, spouses, or roommates is entirely coincidental. And finally, please do not construe anything in this talk as legal advice. Do your own research, as I have done, walk slowly, and carry a big stick. So, first question, what is VidOS? Well, from the README, we learned that VidOS is a complete single-purpose Linux system that just plays videos. Uh, more precisely, it is a bunch of pre-built components and the utility to assemble those components into little Linux distros that boot and play your specified videos. Nothing more, nothing less. Like, quite literally, Vobu, that's VidOS build utility for short, uh, dash V, and then the path to a video file. Uh, that will generate an operating system image that you can stick onto a thumb drive, plug into a laptop, boot up, and play your video. Okay. Why? This seems pretty silly. Well, it was 2020, and uh, for some reason, caustic levels of boredom forced the complete idea fully formed into my head of a prank whereby your buddy boots up their PC and it immediately starts playing Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Now, I guess the idea didn't totally come out of nowhere. I'd been monkeying around with embedded Linuxy type things for a while. Um, so as a proof of concept, I whipped up something in build root. I don't remember exactly what I did, but I think I basically took the x86-64 PC def config, turned a couple of things on, and I mean, the result was a pretty standard ext2, ext4 disk image that was several hundred megabytes in size. It worked, but it left me wanting. Wanting more. You see, I didn't really know what I wanted, but like any good personal project, I had a few goalposts I could no doubt move as needed to stave off my boredom. I wanted to support the newest, most awesomest web video codecs, or, you know, the ones that are supported by um, the big red play button. Uh, for security purposes, and because I'm a killjoy, I wanted it to be read-only, or as the kids these days say, um, immutable, uh, or at least have all of the moving bits be read-only so that no one can do anything naughty with it. Uh, it's one thing to be a harmless prank, it's completely different to be an, an infection vector. And then obviously with the read-only bit, I still wanted it to be easy to arbitrarily yeet in vi uh, arbitrary videos. So like this, I wasn't going to do a one-and-done thing, I needed a system, a system that was stupid simple, stupid small, and stupid easy to use. We're talking no super weird dependencies, no weird tools or tool chains or make files or elevated privileges or anything, and absolutely no compiling. Just because we're making whole entire clandestine Linux distributions from scratch, sort of, uh, doesn't mean the end user should have to compile anything. So, in summary, it's gotta be multi-coding, easy to use and deploy, Secure, which is to say not clever enough to be dangerous, and, and, and small because like, it's just really helpful for a lot of reasons to make something small. So in short, that's M-E-S-S -S or mess. Um, let's begin. Okay, so in any discussion of embedded Linux, I think the most important place to start is at the end. So if we take a look at this, from a high level, this is VidOS right here. So this is, this is literally just an init script and it launches MPV, which are, is our command line video player, with a couple of arguments. If you download almost any distribution, install everything, you download the necessary packages, and you drop this init script or an init script like it, like it in whatever dark recess these things are supposed to live on your system, it's, it's gonna work, it's, it's gonna do the thing. Um, it's just that, well, okay. So now, if you do that, you're going to have to download, install, and configure an entire Linux system. Um, this is fun, once, 
Um, and I mean, like, if you already have one set up, that makes it easier. But if you've got to spin another one up, uh, you know, it's it's a big it's a big chore. Like, especially if you're doing it on an older machine, because modern distributions usually have a lot more intensive resource requirements and just the whole like guided installation process that can take a really long time. So like, you know, best case you get everything up and running within an hour. Worst case you've tried, I don't know, a bunch of different distros and you know, you've drinking like, you've drunk like seven cups of coffee and you just give up and, and, and get a Raspberry Pi. And, and then you have to get the whole video playback thing working. So depending upon how or when during the boot process and what video player you're using, you might have to kill your X11 session or add an auto login thing or add an extra user or, or do more scripting. And it's just, it's, it's a lot like sort of trying to jury rig a car to drive by itself. Um, it's not something, it's something that was really designed to be operated like by a human. So instead of all of that, I decided to automate by spending three-ish years building what is essentially a robot arm to build me, if we're continuing on this analogy, skateboards, which will just roll downhill by themselves. So now that we're done with the end, we can go back to the beginning, or more importantly, the uh, vidOS components directory, which is what will become our final distribution. So uh, a distribution is a kernel and a root file system, and because the kernel is the core of any distribution, we're gonna start there. So you can think of the kernel like a big program in charge of all of the drivers and general infrastructure that we need to run programs on our computer as a very high level simplification. Uh, and, and here we can actually cover the two S's, um, and, and the really cool part that's coming next is that we're gonna compile our own kernel. Yeah! Okay, so this is the Linux make menu config thingamabobber. It's how you configure all the options for the kernel. Uh, I've loaded it with the default configuration for x86-64 PCs. So what you do is you use the arrow keys to scroll, uh, you're, use the arrow keys or the scroll wheel to select things and then you do space or Y to literally turn things on or off. Um, oh, there it is again, but, but bigger. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna dig through all of that and we're gonna find these options, which are by default turned on, and we're gonna turn them off because, if you think about it, we don't need networking to play back videos locally. And it's a vector for attackers. Uh, we don't actually need keyboard input because we don't need a keyboard to play videos. That's what the init script is for, and it's a vector for attackers. And, and actually, we don't need to communicate with our system to get it to play videos. So we're gonna disable that because it's also a vector for attackers. And um, that's basically the major work we do on the kernel in terms of like security. I mean, okay, we do other stuff too just to like make the kernel smaller, but I think this is the really important part. Um, you can think of this a different way. This is our kernel. And obviously we're only gonna do this for the production kernel because for the development kernel, obviously we do need to like interact with the system for debugging at least. Uh, as for what we need to actually like turn on in our production kernel from a high level, it's, it's drivers for stuff. So it's you know stuff like sound, and obviously we need a way to display video to the screen, and, and being able to use GPU acceleration would be really nice. So at the end, our final kernel is about 14 megabytes. Now, time for the root file system. So root file system, for our purposes, is folders on a disk that contain libraries, files, and applications that constitute what we would think of as the whole operating system. Uh, we build our root file system with build root, which is sort of like Linux's make menu config thing, but for building entire Linux distributions. And so basically, we just turn everything off, except for the core system utilities and a video player. So at the end of it, it, it looks like this which is a pretty standard Linux root file system. Uh, and, and most of these are completely empty because again, we only need core system utilities and a video player. And, and normally what you do is you'd put this on some sort of disk somewhere, like in our case, a USB stick. Uh, and then uh, during boot, you would tell the bootloader to tell the kernel where to find the root file system with, with rootfs. And then it's gonna mount that, mount the root file system and, and, and off you go. Um, except that, if you've ever tried running a Linux system, 
off of a USB stick. You know why that sucks? Because running an operating system requires lots of little reads and writes, and also because USB sticks have terrible random access performance. Uh, if you're not actually careful, you might even like wear out your USB stick. But you know what does have great random access performance and almost infinite write endurance? RAM. Okay, so stay with me here for a second. So way, way back in the 2.6 era, kernel developers realized that mounting the root file system could be a gigantic pain in the butt, sometimes. And it would make things easier if we had a bunch of user space tools available to help mount the root file system. So, so what we did is we created an extra root file system whose sole purpose is to help us mount the real root file system. Uh, it is a CPIO archive, which is like tar, but not. Uh, and it is called the init RAM FS, which of course stands for the initial RAM file system. And you don't have to use it, so sometimes it's empty, but it's always technically there. Guess what? So let's put our stuff in there. Okay, so uh, first we're going to create the root file, the CPIO archive by descending into the root file system and running this incredibly convoluted command. Um, boom, now it's 18 megabytes. And then actually we can add some compression. We're gonna do LZ4, boom, 8.7 megabytes. And now in our kernel configuration, we're actually gonna specify a path to our init RAMFS and now it is inside of our kernel, ready to go. So there's actually a special name for this. Uh, it is the Unified Kernel Image, or UKI for short. And this is basically our entire operating system rolled into a burrito. But hold up, you say, like that's super cool, because now we have the root file system, it's inside of the kernel, but we haven't added the videos. So uh, how are we gonna do that? Well, you're right, um, the goose has been stuffed, the donut has been jellied, uh, while you can shuck a Linux kernel to reveal its delicious buttery insides, it's the classic golden goose problem. You can't really put the goose back together again. So I struggled in, with this a little bit in, in the beginning, but then I remembered something from the init ramfs documentation. You can have more than one init ramfs, and anything you add gets smushed together into the final root file system. So we're gonna make another init RAMFS with just our video in the directory that we want it to live inside of the final root file system. We descend into that, create the, the CPIO archive, we add some compression again, and then we tell the bootloader to pass it along to the kernel with the uh, initRD argument. All right, so now we know how to sneak our video past the temple guards. We just gotta figure out what kind of videos we wanna support. And I, I have many, many opinions about uh, video formats and the encoders and decoders to make them. But if we wish to um, dine at uh, Café La Bouton Rouge, uh, my apologies to those French speakers in the audience, then for tonight's menu we, ha we have three classics. Uh, we have the dry aged AV1, pan seared and topped with fresh Opus audio for the discerning palate. We have the smoked WebM, which is wild caught and garnished with capers and uh, dried Opus on the sides. And um, the AVC burger, it comes with bacon, a slice of highly processed bright yellow AAC audio, and uh, no pickles. It's a video, all right. Uh, the good news is that the video player we are using, which is MPV, uses FFmpeg, a command line multimedia editor thing, or, or rather FFmpeg's libraries, and FFmpeg has codecs, that's to say, and encoders and decoders for all of these AV formats. So no big deal, right? We just, we just build a plain Jane, boring copy of FFmpeg, right? Okay, let's try this experiment. We will attempt to download and build a vanilla copy of FFmpeg 4.4.4 for these purposes. So, so nothing extra turned on. Really, really simple. Okay, okay. And now we're going to take a look at the size of our libraries. And we are looking at a total of 99 megabytes. Now, this isn't what we did, obviously, because otherwise our entire root file system would be well over 100 megabytes. 
So FFmpeg is great because it supports a ton of codecs, and that also makes it big. But to be fair, most people don't even build FFmpeg this way. They add extra guacamole. This is the FFmpeg config from Debian 12. Look at how much extra things you can add for an even bigger result. Okay, so that's a normal distro. What happens if we have uh, Buildroot build us a normal grass-fed FFmpeg? Well, uh, Buildroot uses this config, which looks even more horrifying, but what it's actually doing is explicitly turning things off, and the sizes are way, way better. Only 19 megs now. Now, this is still too big, but it's closer. So uh, what did we do to make it smaller? Well, um, it's really simple. We, we just uh, dropped support for all but one specific kind of video in our operating system. Um, and then we just make three different versions of them. So we have one video format per UKI, and now, because FFmpeg already has a built-in WebM decoder, we're going to start with that one. So, first, for FFmpeg config, we're going to turn everything off. Then we're going to enable decoders for the video codecs, VP8, VP9, uh, as well as Opus, obviously, for the audio codec. We're going to enable parsers for the same thing. Uh, we're going to enable support for Matroska, of which the WebM container is actually sort of like a derivative of the Matroska container. Uh, and then this is really important. Um, video files are files, so we do need to enable protocol support for files, very important. And then uh, obviously we have support for uh, you know, the frame buffer device for video and also an, an OSS. And we go ahead and we check our sizes, 3.3 megs. Okay, so uh, moving on. Oh. Yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> basically, okay, so what happened is that Google bought this company called ON2, uh, they made a bunch of video codecs, and, and right after Google bought them, Google came out with a codec they'd been working on called VP8, and they, they released it under an open license that became part of the WebM video format. And uh, well, here's a quote from Larry Horn, the CEO of MPEG LA, which is a patent pool, saying in a extremely convoluted and roundabout way, how they are going to start a patent pool for WebM. Um, things actually got worse. Uh, apparently, the feds actually got involved and started investigating MPEG LA for antitrust practices because of them trying to limit or stifle the flow of WebM as a standard. Um, fortunately, this was a few years ago. Uh, and mommy and Daddy Multinational were able to settle their differences kiss and make up with, with minimal court intervention. So, so now we're going to move on to, uh, to AV1. So uh, this is a little bit more tricky. Uh, we have to go in and select the DAV1D package under target packages, libraries, multimedia in, inside of Buildroot's menu config. So it sets this flag. Um, and then once again for the second time, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. Enable the uh, decoder, decoder for video and audio, parser for AV1 and Opus, same containers, you know. Um, so uh, AOM, or Alliance for Open Media, is the consortium thingy behind AV1, and, and CISBEL is a patent pool administrator. Uh, actually, there's, there's another patent pool administrator. Um, this other one got started in, in 2023. And um, so AOM actually made a statement in 2020 to nobody in particular that they are not frightened, um, saying uh, AO Media is aware of the recent third party announcement attempting to launch a joint patent licensing program for AV1. AO Media was founded to leave behind that very environment that the announcement endorses, one whose high patent royalty requirements and licensing uncertainty limit the potential of free and open online video technology. Um, and I mean, there, to be honest, have been some uh, fair criticisms of the validity of some of these essential patents. Um, here's another one. Uh, this one actually got revoked. And to be honest, I'm not really scared about this. I mean, AV1 is very clearly the future. Like uh, every single video on this website that is uh, 4K or above is only available encoded as a WebM or as AV1. And actually Twitch uh, 
wants to break the 4K live streaming barrier, and uh, they're doing it with AV1. So, um, moving on. Okay, last stop, lads, plads, vermeliads. We have AVC, which of course stands for Advanced Video Coding, uh, also known as H.264, which is defined in MPEG-4 Part 10. Do not confuse this with the video codec defined in MPEG-4 Part 2 Visual, which is entirely different. This is important because MPEG-4 Part 2 Visual can sometimes be referred to as MPEG-4 Video or MPEG-4 ASP, or sometimes as DivX, which is the name of the codec for it, which should in no way be confused for the now defunct video rental service from Circuit City called also DivX, even though it is named after it. And in any case, both of these codecs can be contained in MPEG-4 Part 14, which is the actual MP4 container, you know, that thing. Uh, and of course, those files can also contain MPEG-4 Part 3, Subpart 4, the record, I, I mean, sorry, uh, AVC, uh, the audio codec AAC, of course, standing for Advanced Audio Coding. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm stalling because we, 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 we can't. We just, there's, there's no way. Like, FFmpeg has really good built-in decoders for both, but everything is covered in a thick layer of patents. AVC is fully swaddled by uh, MPEG LA, uh, and AAC by uh, Vial Licensing. Oh, wait, um, I'm sorry, via LA. Yeah, um, two great tastes that taste great together. They uh, joined forces in uh, May of last year. So, so the, the long and short of it is that, and I mean very short of it, is that our best guess for H.264 patent expiry is sometime in 2027. And, and I don't even want to think about AAC. Um, so uh, you can, this is a great article. Um, it's not written by a lawyer, but it's, uh, this guy did a fantastic level of, of research. It's very, very, very good. But, but there are some interesting carve outs. So if we look at this document um, uh, from 2022, uh, we learn that you basically have to pay MPEG LA for every encoder, decoder, or codec, which is both uh, that, that you meant, uh, and for every video that you make for payment, but there is a specific carve out for video that is distributed for free over the internet, uh, hence why it's prevalent on um, Big Red. AAC is a similar game-ish. Uh, you only gotta pay them per codec that you meant, not for the audio you distribute, even if you do sell it. Uh, as for pricing, ABC, it's like 10 cents a unit up to a cap of a couple million dollars. So if you hit that cap, you don't have to pay them any more money. Uh, and of course, every five years, they renegotiate the licensing terms. And of course, that cap has gone up every single time. Uh, as for AAC, the price seems to start at about a dollar and decrease with volume down to about 10 cents. But Whatever happens, you gotta enter a contract, and you gotta do lots of accounting, and you have to pay them out quarterly. And, and suffice to say, I'm, I'm not a big fan of paperwork, and I'm an even smaller fan of large organizations of lawyers. So it's, it's quite settled here. I cannot ship decoders for H.264 and AAC out of the box. Full stop. So let's get out of the box for a moment. You see, another big prong of web video is uh, Video conferencing, something I'm sure we've all grown to uh, love over the last four years. And, and there's this little company called, um, that ships so many software H.264 codecs in their conference boxes that they hit this cap every single year. And because they're such cool dudes and would like to prolif help proliferate a standard, um, they not only open sourced their H.264 codec, here's the GitHub, they hand out pre-cooked binaries. So the pre-cooked ones are free because Cisco compiled them and they already gave MPEG LA millions of dollars. Now, now Cisco could turn around and charge us for them, but in their own words, they're not going to because they're being bros about this. As for AAC, well, guess what? See, Fraunhofer open sourced their AAC codec for Android. Here's the info, here's the source. 
And then someone took that and like spatchcocked it so that it could be used on like a more standard sort of Linux distribution. And then some folks over in Fedora land uh, took a really hard look at the patents and were like, you know, it sure looks like the stuff touching specifically AAC-LC decoding, that's AAC-LC, uh, sorry, that's AAC low complexity, is actually like free and clear of patents. Um, so they took that and deboned it to create FDK AAC free, which only contains the AAC LC decoder. And it is available in frozen nugget form at your local Fedora repo mirror. Okay, well, I guess there are some binary packages available, but I mean, like, how, how are we gonna get them in the root file system? You know, the one that we already like shrink wrapped? Well, here's a hint. Second verse, same as the first. So what we're going to do is we're going to add libopenh264 and libfdkaac to build root as source packages. We're going to build ffmpeg against them. And then we're going to delete them from the root file system before we actually like package it up and build a UKI and ship it out to the end user. And now the end user can agree to the patent licenses, download those binary libraries, and put them into the external init ramfs. All right, so that's the kernel and the video sorted. Now we need to put it in some kind of outer file system that the BIOS or firmware can find and, and boot from. I know. Why not use ISO 9660? It is a read-only file system, you know. Uh, it's this uh, cool specification developed from the, the High Sierra format, which is, of course, named after the High Sierra Group, which is, of course, named after Dell Webb's High Sierra Casino and Hotel, where the group of companies met up to author the initial specification. And, and of course, we will also need to make it bootable, uh, so we will need to use the uh, El Torito extension, uh, which is of course named after the Mexican restaurant where the two original authors developed it. Uh, for the record, I am not making any of this up. <sighs> also, um, I actually bought that belt buckle. I unfortunately did not bring it with me. And now, through the magic of a hybrid MBR, we can not only make this file system bootable from block devices, like USB drives and hard drives, but also from highly sophisticated, optically read worm media, like the compact disc. Okay, so we did all that by hand. Now we gotta make it easy. We gotta, we need to make some sort of like program, or utility to do all the work for us. So um, I'm, I'm thinking we write it in some sort of like uh, high level modern scripting language with, with, with good library support. That's right, JavaScript. <laughs> but, you know, then I'd still need to pick an external interpreter and, and, and package management can be a bit of a pain in the butt with NPM. So um, let's use Bash instead. I'm sure this is a great idea that won't make our lives super difficult and frustrating. So in the beginning, I wrote a simple simple script called probe sh, which would take a path to a video file as an argument, and if it asked some tests, it would push it into the final image. This was extended and then finally subdivided into vogu sh and corresponding config files that live in nested directories inside of the vidOS components directory. Uh, I'm not going to go through every little corner and feature of the vogu script, that's what the readme is for, but I will drag you kicking and screaming through the fundamentals. So, what happens is, you pass Vobu, an argument, to a video file, or files, or directory of files. The all-powerful pick codec function is passed the name of the video, and if the codec hasn't already been specifically set, it runs ffprobe to determine the video's encoding, which is then mapped via Bash's associative array functionality to a video format. Now, um, we do this because the WebM format supports both VP8 and VP9 video, and we need to resolve both of them to WebM. Uh, and then also, uh, once we actually have that information, we can use that later to, um, we can store that and actually use that variable later to select the correct UKI. Uh, once this is set, CheckVid comes along to check the videos to see if they're the specified format. If they are, it puts them into the external init ramfs, and then we do some fun stuff to generate a playlist. And, and that's basically the real magic. I mean, the other functions of VideoS devolve into either downloading stuff, unpacking it, and putting it into the external init ramfs, 
or putting stuff, the VidOS components directory into the external limit RAMFS. Um, now the slightly neat bit is that the Vobu script really just contains the option parsing and video collection logic. Uh, in order to, to support future architectures, as planned, we need to do different stuff so we actually load different functions into the Vobu script using, using the config files uh, located in each architecture directory. Um, so, for instance, this is what the handle firmware function for the specific x86-64 architecture. Um, this is what handles downloading binary firmware blobs uh, for specific GPU support. Uh, and this is the function install ext libs. This is what pulls down um, lib fdk aac free and open h264 from, uh, from uh, Cisco's canonical repository and also from um, uh, one of the Fedora uh, repos. And um, look, Bash is the thing that really kind of ties this whole mess together. But these are actually our only dependencies because one of the nice things that Bash does is let us lean very, very heavily on the Unix philosophy. Okay, so end game. This is everything that XORISO takes and actually bakes into our final ISO 9660 file system. Um, so we have the EFI directory, that's for EFI support. Um, we have our uh, video directory, that's where videos would live if they are um, being put on disk instead of if they're too big to put into the final init RIMFS. And then of course we have our stuff for ISO Linux, which is our bootloader. We have of course our kernel and our root FS CPIO.LZ4, which is where, where our video lives. So essentially we're looking at about 23 megabytes plus however big our video is, or videos are, in terms of our operating system. But just one more thing. I want to actually answer this question. But I want to state, for the record, before I do that, that this whole thing is not a new idea. So Movix, or eMovix, uh, was a project from the early 2000s that actually assembled a lightweight distro for multimedia playback using Slackware and mPlayer, which is actually, MPV is actually a fork of. Um, I actually learned about this a full year into my development of VidOS. <laughs> um, this was abandoned sometime in mid-2006, although there is still a plugin for this inside of K3B. Um, Cathode Ray Dude has a whole series of videos about PCs from the early 2000s that could dual boot other like tiny immutable Linux operating systems for stuff like really simple office tasks and really quick multimedia playback. And, and actually, <laughs> in 1965, there were two different brands of 16 millimeter film based video jukeboxes that were installed both in cocktail bars in America and in France. And now, well, digital signage is everywhere. And we do it with stuff like this digital signage player. Uh, Bright Sign is basically um, Roku wearing their business hat. Um, so we have something like this. This is one of their simplest, cheapest ones. It's $300. So you could buy that. Or, you know, you could also just adopt a thin client. Rescue it from a landfill on eBay for maybe 30, 40 bucks, and then you could just type vobu dash v and the path to a video file. That's my talk. I would very much like to thank uh, Rob Landley for his documentation on the Linux and RamFS, um, David Hand on his absolutely wonderful talk at the uh, Pearl Raku Conf called uh, Init RamFS for Fun and um, uh, that's the entire name of the talk. Um, Sal Kimmick for getting me up here, and of course, my parents, to whom I owe uh, much more than I'm willing to admit. <laughs> Any questions? Do you have a YouTube channel? <laughs> I do not have a YouTube channel. It's something I've thought about very, very hard, but I'm not quite sure if I'm willing to make that jump yet. Can you pixie boot it? So... Um, yes, that gets interesting because obviously you basically only get to load like one file. So, um, 
it gets funky. So obviously, like if it was just the UKI, like you could just pixie boot that and then it would just go. But the reality is, is that as it stands right now, um, you need to also be able to pull the secondary innate ramifest. And so the kernel, um, and so, yeah, you would either have to custom actually wrap the video into the first innate ramifest, or I would have to, something I am actually considering doing is, is actually adding um, not NFS support necessarily, but like some sort of like SSH, um, uh, SFTP support perhaps, whereby you could sort of network boot a generic image. And then, believe it or not, you can actually communicate with MPV via a JSON schema through local sockets. Um, and of course, because they're just sockets, we could pipe those sockets over SSH, for instance. And so you could do some sort of absolutely horrifying thing where you have a master server that's, uh, uh, that can um, boot all of these, uh, boot all of these little, little external devices and then securely um, send them messages over a socket to uh, attach to a SFTP directory and attach to a playlist and play those video files. That's something I'm thinking about adding, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. This is all fully local as it stands right now. Well, doesn't, doesn't Pixie Boot allow you to do a kernel and then an edit RD? So, the funky thing about that init RD argument is that it's kind of not actually an argument to the kernel, it's an argument to the boot. In this case, I guess it would be, but it's on, well, normally on, on disk, it's an argument essentially to the it's an argument essentially to the the bootloader, the thing that's responsible for that. So I'm not I'm I'm not sure that you can TFTP boot multiple files. What I've what I've normally seen or what my understanding was is that like you boot the kernel and then the kernel has like NFS support, and so then like it goes and it looks for. And then it can go and look for a network share to mount to pull its root file system from. So I'm not entirely certain. I, I need to research that some more. On um, the normal Linux distro, you can watch videos from YouTube or whatever. What's mm -hmm. the critical difference uh, in terms of patents and IP of why you can't, of, of why you couldn't ship one of the FFmpeg stuff, but like I can just like install it on the Vitor? So, um, so I'm shipping, I'm shipping binaries. So if I, if I take source from, cause like FFmpeg has a much better multi-threaded H.264 decoder, for instance. Um, if I take that and, and I compile it, I'm the person who made it. And then if I put that up on the internet, and people download more than, I think it's like 100,000 copies, then I am liable to pay to enter a contract with MPEG LA and, and, and pay them money. Um, something that's very interesting, actually, is that, like, uh, so the whole reason why Cisco originally came out, originally open sourced their OpenH264 codec, I'm just using it to like play back videos, but, but the, the real reason why they open sourced it is for, for WebRTC, for web video conferencing, um, because WebRTC, the official WebRTC standard defines two video codecs that you have to support at minimum, VP8 and H.264 um, constrained baseline profile. And so like, obviously like VP8, that's free, you know, you can do that, whatever. But like, if you have, but like, if you, if you have used a WebRTC implementation on top of Firefox, the encoder that Firefox is using to encode H.264 video and send it to the other, send it to the other party is libopenh264. Firefox is literally just downloading libopenh264 and, um, and using that. They're downloading it separately as a binary 
so they so that they don't have to deal with uh, so that they don't have to deal deal with actually compiling it in, in house and again um, accepting the uh, accepting the burden of, of liability for that. Technically, actually, when you the end user download the Cisco um, lib open H two six four binary, you have to comply with the M with MPEG LA's binary license which has stuff in there about basically like not using this for remuneration and, 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 and stuff like that. But it, it, doing it this way completely removes me from the chain of liability. It's, it's, it becomes immediately the relationship between the end user of VidOS, the person who is creating the ISO, and Cisco slash MPEG LA. Is that I don't know. It, I've, I'm just generally pretty anal retentive when it comes to stuff like this. It's possible that they just don't care, or it's possible that they're hosting it other places. Different jurisdictions have different, like I know, I'm pretty sure there are jurisdictions in Europe that basically don't recognize software patents. So maybe it has something to do with that. I'm not quite certain, frankly. Um, this is just what I learned from, again, I'm not a lawyer. This is just what I learned sort of from, from my research. And it's like, basically it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what uh, Canonical is doing with this, but like Mozilla was forthright enough to remove themselves from the transaction by using LiveOpenH264. So there's clearly differing opinions on this. My understanding is that canonical because they're incorporated in the Isle of Man. Oh. Although EU, well, when they originally they were following EU and then British law, and that they consider themselves outside of that. Oh. Fedora is their legal advice when they were the deep pockets behind. Mm -hmm. Made it so that you could get it, mm -hmm. but it had to be the end user enabling the Cooper repositories that had any. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that would that that makes sense. That makes sense. This might have just been my misunderstanding, but the, uh, to clear up something, first of all, uh, mm -hmm. three different builds of FFmpeg. So yes, three different builds of FFmpeg for three different unified kernel images. Okay, so uh, at some point you showed that ah, we can support a directory of videos, mm -hmm. and so now I'm seeing okay, three different formats of videos are found all at once, mm -hmm. so then do you really, in your image, have three kernels and three builds of FFmpeg? No. Okay. So, so um, there are some, I actually go in excru possibly t way too excru excruciating length to describe the behavior of this inside of, uh, inside of the readme. But basically what happens is that um, find, I, I'm using the find command. So if you just give it a directory of files, I'm using the find command. And the first file it finds, it takes that, runs ffprobe to figure out what format it's, it's in. If that format matches one of the format it supports, cool. It, it takes that format, sets that as, this is the format I am going to use now. Takes that video, pops it over here, and then, okay, this is, this is the format I'm going to look for now, and it's gonna look through all of the directory of files, and it's gonna find files with that format, and if it finds them, grab them and move them over. Okay. Um, if you don't want it to do that, you can just specify, this is the format I want, specifically. It. And it will go in and, and find those. Um, the reason why I sort of picked, like just sort of we're gonna do one format at a time is because I just, well, I mean, I kinda had to start somewhere. And it was, again, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, the, patent licensing around different formats is like all over the place. And it's like, if my, my concern was like, if I have it support a whole bunch of stuff, obviously that makes it very, very big. Conceivably, would it make sense for me to just sort of make like a, you know, VidOS free that supports like two or three sort of known formats that I know are totally free and clear of patents? Yeah, 
possibly it would probably grow things by like five or ten megs. You know, maybe I should make a combined one that's like VP8, VP9, AV1, and like you know MPEG2 or something like that. Well, my question would be sort of why do you didn't just use FFmpeg on the main system that before you built it mm -hmm. and just re-encode down to a single codec? So, um, so video from large streaming sites from, oh, I would say over the top, or video, video that has been, the video that is distributed on huge, on huge platforms has been, um, let's say, chewed on within an inch of its life. <laughs> um, because, you know, big players like YouTube or whatever have to deal with the bandwidth to deliver it to you. They want to make it, I mean, Netflix, Netflix created something called VMAF, Video Multimode Assessment Fusion, which like it's a, it's a research project they worked on with the university, which is like a model that like looks at a source video and a re-encoded video um, with sort of a, a human perception of detail um, and basically, ba and basically uh, gives the re-encoded video a score of zero to 100% based on how well it compares to the original. Because um, Netflix does all sorts of horrifying things where they like cut the video into segments and then like re-encode the different segments at like different resolution and bitrate ladders and, 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 and all sorts of horrifying things. Basically, my whole goal is that you should be able to um, somehow, through some sort of unknown and undefined and undetermined means, um, procure videos that may possibly have been hosted on this very large uh, uh, video site and just play them directly. I, I basically, my, my, basically, my core belief is that uh, most video encoding is a lossy process. And like, if you don't have to, if you don't have to re-encode something, if you can just play it back, just, just do that. Because things, the video that you got is probably already, if you encode it one more time, it's going to look really bad, basically. So uh, throughout this process, what were the things that, that you learned that you didn't think you were going to, I mean, what were the surprise learnings? So EFI support. Oh, God. Oh, God. So I was looking at the um, EFI specification, basically. I was looking at the EFI specification, and I was looking at like XORISO and how it like basically did that. Because people say all sorts of basic different things about this. But basically, as far as my experience is, is that EFI, not to be confused with Secure Boot, Secure Boot is an option, EFI basically expects a FAT32 file system. And it's like, OK, well, ISO 9660 is not a FAT32 file system. And like, we have ISOs that boot on systems with EFI, so like, how does does that work? And then I literally saw something. It was either in the EFI specification or in the the XOR ISO documentation that was basically like, yeah, you make a um, FAT32 image blob, and then you stick that on the root of the ISO 9660 file system, and then you basically in like the um, it's like the MBR or whatever the equivalent is. You basically have a, a pointer to that in the system. And I was like, that, no, that, that can't be. And so just for yucks, I just like downloaded an Ubuntu ISO and took it apart. And it was like, oh, God, no, that's, that's how you do that. It's truly, truly, truly horrifying. Yeah, that's how all my ISOs are built. Yeah, and, and so I actually have I actually have an option that will build you one with regular BIOS support, which just uses SysLinux, one with um, EFI support, which I'm using. This is annoying. I'm building my UKI with the um, the the EFI stub, so it does look like an EFI executable. And again, if I just had one thing that I was loading, that would be fine. I wouldn't need an intermediate loader, but because I'm handling both a UKI and an external init RAMFS, I basically need 
a EFI bootloader, except that they don't call it a bootloader in the EFI realm. They call it a, a boot manager. So I'm actually using, the audience is going to turn on me now. <sighs> I'm using the project formerly known as Gummy Boot, which was adopted by the Systemd project, which is now called Systemd Boot. Um, but I am using that to basically load the, um, I'm using that to load my UKI and my um, external init RAMFS when I'm, I'm doing the whole EFI thing. Well, Papa Web uses system D as our default bootloader. Mm. Mostly because it's a small enough code base that a quick security review was actually possible. Oh, okay. Um, it certainly allowed us to sidestep a number of CDs that hit grub, mostly because grub yeah. is such a large I, code base. I completely avoided grub. I did, I was like, I'm going to use SysLinux because I've, I've looked at Grub and it's like, nobody ever ships a default Grub configuration. Everybody seems to just like pull big masses of wires out of it and, and do all sorts of things to it because Grub seems sort of kind of too big and kind of too Swiss army knife like. Um, well, Grub will still do deck out. Well, it's good to have priorities, I guess. Um, you're out of time. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.